<laughs> Hi everyone, this evening we're here with Dr. Giddick. Dr. Giddick is a director of cardiology from Mount Sinai Doctors in Westchester. He's also a dear friend of mine. He does integrative cardiology and we think alike and I love him. Hopefully you get the benefit of um, picking his brain with this session. Um, he's going to talk about your mind and your heart, the intimate connection between stress and your heart. Here we go. Thank you so much, June. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody, and I hope I can shed a little bit of light that people can at least have to take home one important message of something they didn't know before. So the topic I'm going to talk about is the intimate connection that exists between your mind and your heart. So First off, I think we should just talk in general about what an important driver of health outcomes our emotions are. So we all probably know mental stress is ubiquitous in the society around us. And many of us, fortunately and unfortunately, have their firsthand experience with this. I say fortunately because stress can actually be a driver of enhanced performance. Uh, it's when it becomes overwhelming that it's a problem. Speaking of overwhelming stress, it has never been more of a problem, probably in most of our lifetimes, uh, than during the last um, year or so of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I know both myself, uh, and I'm sure you and many other doctors have seen tons of people coming with symptoms related to stress. So this is a timely topic indeed. So up to 60 to 80% of all primary care visits are thought to be related to some physical manifestation of stress. We know that psychological state has a particularly profound impact on heart health. And one analysis done by the Mayo Clinic identified stress as actually the number one most powerful predictor of cardiac events, even more powerful than cigarette smoking. Wow. So we're talking about a true villain for, uh, when it comes to our health. So how does psychological state impact cardiac health? Well, before we get into the possible mechanisms, let's talk about some statistics. It is well documented in lots and lots of studies that depression approximately will double your risk of having a heart attack for the first time. Maybe even more scary is that if you survive a heart attack, you have approximately a 40% chance of developing clinical depression. And if you do develop depression after a heart attack, it raises your risk for a second heart attack threefold. Interestingly, studies also show a relationship in dose, meaning the more severe a person's depressive symptoms, the greater their risk of cardiac illness. So while not proof, this is very suggestive that there is an important cause of it. Depression is highly prevalent, not only in coronary disease, heart attack patients, but also those with congestive heart failure. And there's this similar dose response pattern observed for cardiac death in patients with heart failure. With regards to anxiety, another very important mental function issue, we have seen studies reporting anywhere from two to six times higher risk of cardiac events. And those events span the spectrum from heart attacks and stents to all sorts of arrhythmias, some of which are potentially life-threatening, and even sudden death. We also know that yeah. higher levels of anger and hostility stores raise the risk for coronary events and arrhythmias. Studies have shown that people who score high on measures of optimism have a 30 to 40% lower risk of death from coronary disease or stroke. Similarly, uh, at least one study has shown that people who score high on a strong sense of life purpose have a lower risk of strokes. And there have been many uh, psychological well-being measures that have been looked at that have been associated with reductions in important risk factors for heart disease such as blood pressure, cholesterol, and insulin sensitivity. So let's talk a little bit of, about what we know about the biology. What might be the mechanisms that connect the mind to the heart? So we'll start talking about inflammation, which is perhaps uh, the most significant of all of these mechanisms. Inflammation, as many of you probably know and have heard about, results from a dysregulation in the immune system function. 
We all have an immune system that every day is constantly policing our body and keeping things in an important uh, state of functioning and looking for threats from the outside that it needs to respond to. When that response goes awry, it causes excessive inflammation. Chemical mediators produced by cells in the immune system, for instance, cytokines, can have effects both in the area where they're produced and through the bloodstream on distant organs. It is well known for many years now that inflammation within the walls of arteries, including within the cholesterol plaques that make up atherosclerosis, is absolutely crucial to the process. You cannot form atherosclerosis without having inflammation in the artery wall. And it's important not only to the initial stages, but progression and eventually artery obstruction and heart attack. What's perhaps less well known is that inflammation is also implicated as important in the pathogenesis of congestive heart failure, even in the absence of coronary artery blood flow problems. Levels of cytokines and something called C-reactive protein, which is an important marker of inflammation in the body, have repeatedly been shown to be elevated in patients with coronary heart disease and heart failure. There has been scientific research that has shown some of these cytokines may cause problems that could explain cardiac disease. For instance, endothelial dysfunction, which refers to the endothelial cells that line the artery wall and create the interface with the bloodstream. Those are the first line defense against cholesterol particles getting into the artery wall and beginning the process of plaque formation. And cytokines may cause abnormality in function there. They may also cause abnormalities in the artery walls constricting to cut off blood flow and formation of cholesterol plaque. What's intriguing is that markers of inflammation are also seen to be elevated in people who suffer from depression and anxiety. So it's, it's um, tempting to think about that this may actually be a causal link between the two diseases. Another very important biological mechanism is the sympathetic nervous system. So our involuntary nervous system, also called our autonomic nervous system, has two components the sympathetic, which is the fight or flight, and the parasympathetic. The parasympathetic promotes relaxation and homeostasis, meaning control and balance among biological processes. Whereas the sympathetic is revved up, need to run away from a threat, kick into high gear. There is a lot of research that shows under conditions of positive psychological well-being, the two components of the autonomic nervous system are well balanced. They work synergistically. Conditions of mental stress, depression, or anxiety all show increased levels of sympathetic activation on average, and it creates an imbalance in the autonomic nervous system. Higher levels of sympathetic nervous system activity increase blood pressure and heart rate, both chronically at rest and reactively to stressors like mental stress or outside triggers. Clinical hypertension, so elevated resting blood pressure in the doctor's office or at home is two and a half times more likely with high stress or anxiety. And I'm not referring to a sudden raise in blood pressure from a stressful event. This is persistent hypertension. We also know that sympathetic nervous system activity can increase inflammation and can also cause endothelial dysfunction and vasoconstriction, which we already talked about how important those can be to heart health. Now, you cannot talk about autonomic nervous system function and heart health without talking about heart rate variability. So what is heart rate variability? This, when you observe over a window of time a person's heartbeat, and you use sensitive diagnostic tools, you can measure millisecond differences in the time interval from one heartbeat to the other. And over the course of time, you expect to see a healthy amount of fluctuation in the time interval from one heartbeat to the other. It should be a fairly wide range of intervals from beat to beat. This is referred to as heart rate variability, and it is the most pronounced measure that we have to assess the balance between the two components of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. 
when they are in good balance, we see a lot of fluctuations in the time uh, intervals from heart to heart. That is returned a high amount of heart rate variability. When you see reduced heart rate variability, a constriction in the amount of, of variation in time between heartbeats. This is a well-known marker for increased cardiac risk, both heart attacks, arrhythm arrhythmias, and sudden death. Stress, anxiety, and depression all disrupt this balance. They have all been associated with reduced heart rate variability. A quick word about a few other mechanisms. Stress and anxiety can both sometimes lead to increased cholesterol levels. These mental states have all been associated with increased platelet activation. These are the cells that are always streaming by in the bloodstream in everybody. They have important biological functioning. And in cases of heart attack, they become abnormally activated and are an integral part of the clot that forms. So we don't want high levels of activation of our platelets. Very importantly, and very common in the work that I do, is that these conditions can lead to elevated cortisol. High levels of cortisol can be uh, a driving force in heart disease through a number of ways. It causes changes in multiple areas of our biological functioning that all can increase cardiovascular risk. These include changes in our body fat distribution where adipose tissue tends to accumulate around our abdominal organs. It can cause insulin resistance where our body stops responding normally to our pancreas signal of insulin which can lead to pre-diabetes and diabetes, potent risk factors for heart disease. It can cause abnormal lipid values, increases in inflammation. Finally, a very interesting uh, area of research is that the heart may actually have its own nervous system supply. And in that way, our thoughts and our reactions to things may directly influence the heart through nerves. The HeartMath Institute is a pioneering organization that studies heart rate variability. And they have found that the brain can actually directly influence the heart at times. When they look at heart rate variability in people, they can tell scientifically that subjects who intentionally generate positive emotions, such as gratitude, can shift the measured amount of heart rate variability to a much more positive and healthy version as they start focusing on these emotions. So let's talk about what is ultimately the holy grail of this whole topic. What is the evidence that interventions that affect how our mind and heart communicate can actually reduce risk? So the first thing I wanna say about this is that this is an area of research that can be extremely demanding and challenging. It's much easier to do research on two groups of people that are randomized to take either a pill or a placebo or to have a device implanted or not. You know that they're getting the treatment and there's limited issues with compliance. When you're trying to study yoga or meditation or a different mind-heart intervention. You need to teach people how to do it, hope they learn how to do it effectively, and then hope that they continue doing it at home. So as you can imagine, the results can be mixed. But while there are some studies that do not show benefits, there are a great many and a growing number that do. However, one common thread in almost all the studies is that there are consistent improvements in measures of psychological well-being when these techniques are employed. And so what I often say to my patients is, even if I can't do anything else for you other than to make you feel better emotionally, we've achieved something. And those studies have shown statistically significant improvements even in cardiac patients. However, going beyond that, there are many studies that have found measurable improvements in cardiac risk factors, cardiac function, and clinical outcomes. So let me get into that in a little bit more detail. So let's start talking about blood pressure. This is the area that has probably been the most widely researched in this field and has the greatest evidence for it. There have been statistically significant reductions shown in blood pressure in a wide range of people. 
We have seen it in people who are normal with normal blood pressure and no heart disease. It's been shown in those who suffer from hypertension, as well as those with established heart disease, such as coronary disease, congestive heart failure, and atrial fibrillation. The blood pressure benefits have been documented in studies that have looked at all of the following techniques. Device-guided slow abdominal breathing. So this is a healthy abdominal breathing that promotes balance in the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. When just that breathing technique is employed, there have been benefits in blood pressure. Meditation, yoga, heart rate variability biofeedback. So a technique that uses data from a device to show you when you're getting your heart rate variability, which is an optimal range. Something called autogenic training, which is a visualization uh, of feeling of warmth and heaviness in the limbs, as well as progressive muscle relaxation, which as the name implies, is intentional constricting and then relaxing of muscle groups throughout the body. What's impressive when you look at the data on blood pressure is that the magnitude of blood pressure effect in some of these studies has been on par with what's been seen in, in trials of, act, of medications. Some of the studies have shown an average blood pressure lowering of 10 points. Now these are blood pressures taken in a clinic at random times. This is not an acute blood pressure effect lowering because you relax right at that moment, it's lower. This is, could be days later if you've been doing this regularly. And I also wanna point out that what I tell a lot of my patients is, while an average is an average, that means that there are many people who had more than 10 points of lower. And so you can sometimes see in an individual who responds very nicely, significant double digit signs. Another very compelling piece of evidence, which is maybe the most impressive uh, in the blood pressure, mind, heart uh, field, is that there was a study that taught transcendental meditation to a cohort of patients with hypertension. They taught them the, the procedure and they asked them to perform it for 20 minutes in two sessions a day and followed them for five years. And during that time, they found a statistically significant reduction in cardiac events in the group that practiced meditation. <coughs> this has not yet been replicated, but it is very, very compelling. So let's talk about coronary artery disease. This refers to anybody who's developed atherosclerosis that closes off their coronary arteries or God forbid a sudden heart attack. The most powerful evidence in this field comes from Dean Ornish's studies. Many of you have probably heard his name. He is a pioneer in this field. What Dean Ornish did is he created randomized trials where he took, he had one group that were of controls and one group that participated in an intensive program. And their intensive program was multifactorial. It was not just about relaxation. It included stress management and group sessions to discuss these techniques, as well as a strict vegan diet and regular exercise. So we can't tease out the exact components that led to the observed benefits, but stress management was likely an important contributor. His studies showed a variety of remarkable benefits, and there have been several publications put out. He showed drastic reductions in frequency of angina episodes, so symptoms of chest pain related to blood flow. In the group that had the intervention, there was, I believe, something like a 70% lower frequency of angina symptoms compared to when they started. Objectively, these patients who were in the uh, intervention group were able to exercise longer. They also had blinded stress tests and interpretation by readers who did not know who was in the group with the intervention and who was not. And they found improvements in measures of cardiac function and blood flow on very sensitive tests. And perhaps most compelling is that on studies done looking very closely at the coronary arteries, they found actual reversal of the amount of atherosclerotic plaque on some of the injuries that were studied. There have been other studies in coronary artery disease patients. One such study looked at yoga practice and found that it also reduced 
frequency of symptoms of angina, as well as reduced markers of inflammation and cortisol levels in the body and improved heart rate variability. There was a study using transcendental meditation for seven months. It was a very small study, but again, they did blinded assessments by independent leaders of stress tests and found longer exercise time and improved measures of ischemia, which is when your EKG suggests that your heart is not getting enough blood flow. This may have been mediated by the fact that they found that people who had gone through the meditation intervention had less spikes in heart rate and blood pressure during it. In congestive heart failure, there have been studies of meditation and yoga that have shown important improvements statistically in symptoms of breathlessness and fatigue in this group. These are the symptoms that are most commonly lifestyle limiting in congestive heart failure patients. And in my own practice, I can tell you that while we have incredibly good medications that prolong life in congestive heart failure and decrease the likelihood of being hospitalized for sudden uh, retention of significant amounts of fluid, the medications often do not help these symptoms. So it's nice to have another tool in the toolkit that can help them. Again, not subjective, but objectively looking at tests that were done, these patients were able to walk longer on a standard six minute walk test, which is commonly done in research studies of congestive heart failure. And notably, the magnitude of how much longer they were able to walk in those six minutes was of a similar magnitude to what has been seen in drugs for these types of interventions. There have also been studies using the heart rate variability biofeedback mechanism that I talked about, where you get real-time data on how your heart rate variability is responding to your emotions and your thoughts. And these have shown improvements in shortness of breath symptoms in heart failure patients as well. Atrial fibrillation, which is a type of arrhythmia that causes irregular and fast heart rhythms, has been studied in a trial of three months of yoga, which documented improved symptoms in the disease, as well as fewer detected arrhythmias on heart rhythm monitors, which were analyzed by blinded interpreters. So just to mention a few other important points when we talk about the evidence for clinical improvements in mind-body techniques. There has been evidence that regular gratitude practice, which is consciously thinking about or even journaling about thoughts of things that make you grateful and thankful, that has been shown to improve sleep. Now, this is very important because impaired sleep, sleep is highly linked to high risk of cardiovascular disease. And there are very few interventions uh, in the traditional cardiology toolbox to improve sleep. There are also many studies that show patients who have a regular spirituality practice in their life, whether it's formal religion or other, have lower risks of mental health issues and also have lower incidence of hypertension, heart attacks, or cardiac death rates. Importantly, um, I'm sure everybody that is listening to this knows that exercise is one of our strongest medicines for heart health. What many people may not know is that exercise reduces depression symptoms. And that, that works both chronically as well as for somebody who's feeling depressed, their measures of symptoms improve dramatically within a few vigorous exercise session. Importantly, exercise also has been linked to lower levels of markers in the blood for inflammation and oxidative stress, two very important processes in heart health, and reduced cortisol levels, which I mentioned before as very important. Though. So there's a few take-home conclusions that I think you should bear in mind uh, when you try to still down what we know about this area. First of all, psychological distress and mental stress are everywhere. It's a fantasy for most people to think that they can avoid it. So the question is, what can we control about how we react to stress in our lives? Controlling it is important because it is an incredibly strong risk to cardiac health on a par with cigarette smoking which many of us know we stay away from at all costs. So I would encourage people to think similarly about stress. 
The rates of almost every major cardiac disease has been documented to be higher in those with depression, anxiety, high mental stress, and a host of other measures of impaired psychological well-being. Scientific research has established possible links to several biological mechanisms that could play a role in linking our thoughts and emotions to our heart, such as the ones I've listed here, which I spoke about before. There have been many human clinical trials now, some of which have shown results, others which haven't, and there are potential methodological problems like I described that may explain the variance in results. However, on balance, there are many studies that employ a wide range of these techniques that have shown improvements in a spectrum of findings, ranging from improvements in risk factors for heart disease, such as blood pressure and cholesterol, to improved symptoms in patients who have established diagnosed heart disease, to objective measures on blinded tests when people did not know who meditated or practiced yoga and who didn't, to actual reductions in measures of plaque volume using very highly sensitive invasive techniques. And finally, some studies have shown improvements in actual event rates. The last thing I want to let you know, which is very underappreciated, and you might want to bring this to your cardiologist if they are having a hard time encouraging you in these practices, is that the American Heart Association, which I think we would all agree is just about as official of a, of a cardiac society guidance we could ask for, established an expert panel to put out consensus statements after reviewing the literature on the various techniques that I mentioned. And their conclusions were that for many of the techniques, the possibility of benefit was significant when reviewing the evidence. And because the possibility of harm is essentially zero, they concluded that it is a reasonable intervention to try for patients who are suffering from either these diseases or the risk factors or high stress and, and psychological distress. So that does it for the talk. And uh, if there are questions or comments, I am um, happy to engage. That's good. That was so good. Thank you, Dr. Gideon. Is there any practice that you actually do yourself? Yes. So I do several of these. I mean, regular exercise is, is critical for so many things. Um, including management of stress. And what I do professionally uh, lends itself to stress. And um, it's actually well documented that that is nothing short of, of a pandemic among physicians these days. Um, but in addition to exercise, I try to uh, practice several of this, these techniques on a regular basis. Um, meditation, I, I haven't been trained as much in transcendental meditation, but I practice mindfulness-based stress reduction, a technique where we try to focus our attention on different things, whether that we are feeling in our body, like our breath, um, and that can be very helpful. Um, something that I tell my patients, because I think as much as anybody out there, I struggle for time to, in my day, in my schedule to do these things. And what I have found helpful is I, I actually started engaging regularly in driving that. We have to be in the car for a certain amount of time. And, you know, our mind wanders like crazy. And I can sometimes feel my breathing becoming more shallow as I'm going through the list of all the things that I still have to do when I get to home or office. So there are a lot of these techniques that are guided that you can listen to on the calm or inside timer apps or YouTube. Um, and, you know, it actually doesn't distract you from the road. It has you focusing on your surroundings and your, and your attention. Um, I also like autogenic training, by the way, which, which I find is a very underused technique. But for me, I think that when people try it, the visualization of the sensations through the body is it's probably uh, that and slow diaphragmatic breathing are the ones that I find are the most instantaneous at reducing stress and, and related symptoms in the body. Um, so for me, those are the ones that work best. Driving meditation, I've never really heard of. That's interesting, but I guess you could listen to like calm app and drive. Yeah, 
with I your mean, eyes when, open, when, right? <laughs> when, I first, when I first did it, it, you know, I thought to myself, how am I going to pay attention to the road? But what they're, what they're really doing is telling you, you know, first start off just looking at the road, look at the cars, you know, don't have your mind be elsewhere. Look right. at the trees, look at the sky for a second, and then back on the road. And I find actually enhances my, my, my attention. Um, but it's nice because you also focus on what your body is feeling. You know, some of us are sitting in uncomfortable car seats, right. um, or the temperature is not controlled. And it kind of gets you in touch with your body in a way that you can know you Can you tell us a little bit more about autogenic training? How do you do that? So the practice of autogenic training, um, it's a little bit less convenient because you should be ideally lying down flat, although it can be done in a chair. And what you do is, and by the way, this can be done also with guided imagery, you know, dictation, listening to somebody talking you through it on these apps. But you focus on various parts of your body. You start usually with either your head or neck or one of your arms, and you focus all your intention on visualizing a feeling of warmth and heaviness in that part of your body. So you'll feel your shoulders or neck or your right arm, let's say, becoming heavier and warmer and really sinking down into the mattress you're laying on and into the arms of your chair. And you'll do this for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and then you'll move on to another part of the body. And eventually you go through the whole body and then you try to visualize that sensation going through your entire body like your skull. And it really can very rapidly promote a feeling of stress never done that either. I guess I have to try. You're telling yourself to go deep into the mattress and just focusing on like warmth on that one area and then right. from one part to right. another. Right. So you'll, you'll tell your body or, or you'll listen to someone saying it, your right arm is getting warm. Mm. Your right arm, feel your right arm getting warm and heavy now. So now your arm feels like bricks sinking into the mattress and you really start to visualize it happening. Um, and you know, when you do we all store tension in different places, right? For some of us, it goes mostly to our necks, our shoulders, our belly. Those are, you know, some of us, it's the jaw and the, or the forehead. And when you focus the, this visualization in those areas, I find it really um, powerful to actually get those muscles to lighten up and, and relax and, and, and dispel that feeling. So you start up by saying it heavier and warmer, and then do you end up saying lighter and more relaxed or refreshed? Well, correct. Once you've gone through the whole body and you're focusing on heaviness and warmth, then you focus on that feeling through your whole body and then you try to gradually lighten up and have your mind sort of start to come into your space around you with a very light awareness. Right. It's almost like hypnosis in a bit. Yeah. yeah. I've done it actually with my children when they've had trouble falling asleep and they love it. Oh, that's awesome. That's really good. This, did acupuncture have any studies or evidence you found with stress reduction and cardiac disease? You know, I don't know the literature on acupuncture well because it's really, as you know better than me, less of a mind-body study, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so it doesn't get covered in the in the areas that I was doing the reviewing. Got it. But yoga was, and tai, did Tai Chi come up at all? So there, there is research on Tai Chi. There is research on on Qigong as well. Um, a lot less but some, and Tai Chi actually has shown benefits for blood pressure. Right, lowering blood pressure, right? That literature exists, yeah. I actually remember that from residency like 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. I believe, and you may correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that there are studies that have shown blood pressure lowering from acupuncture as well. I don't know, yeah. um, you know what the balance of the record is. Yeah, most definitely acupuncture has like profound effect on your immune system to white blood cells going up and all of that. Yeah, that's interesting. Anything else we wanted done? So I think that pretty much covered it. I mean, you know, I guess what I would say is kind of a take home point for your patients is that a lot of the time they're going to be seeing primary care doctors or cardiologists that don't think very much in this way um, mm -hmm. and might not be open to, it, to their uh, considering it. Um, but I think it's important and patients can advocate for themselves. So when somebody goes to the doctor and they say, you know, your blood pressure has been very high the last two times you've come to see me in the last two mm -hmm. months and I want you to start a medication. 
Of course, there are times where there's enough of a clinical risk that you need to get the blood pressure down quickly. But right. there are many times if somebody's going through a particularly tumultuous time psychologically, where it makes sense to try some of these things first and closely monitor the blood pressure. Most and definitely. so, um, you know, arming yourself with a little bit of knowledge that there's even an American Heart Association statement saying that this is reasonable to try can go a long way. Yeah, most definitely. What really um, wrongs like a, a chord with me is that sort of gratitude journal and like your attitude and positive outlook on life actually change your cardiovascular risk. I think that's really, really true. Because when I start people on gratitude journal and I make them do gratitude journal at night and I make them like measure out their blood pressure in the morning, as they're doing them, their blood pressure is actually lowering. I'm sure. And one of the reasons for that is that there's a lot of evidence that their sleep quantity and quality improves with that. Right, 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 right. Um, I don't know if you have this, but patients um, can track that, you know, with a whole bunch of wearables now, some of which are pretty, right, pretty the ring, the sensitive, watch. right, the aura ring. Um, so that's going to be very important. And actually, you know, what's interesting is we know for many, many years, we've had this data that heart attacks and strokes, if you divide the 24 hour day cycle into mm -hmm. hour segments, mm -hmm. the peak incidence of heart attacks and strokes is early in the morning, like early between morning. around six and 8 a.m. Why is that? Nobody ever knows exactly why that is, but the most compelling reason is that for most people, blood pressure spikes highest during the late, more, the, the late time of your sleep. So mm -hmm. four, five, six, seven a.m. Um, and so a, a spike in blood pressure around that time, if too high, can have very deleterious impacts. Now, for sure, there's many studies that show when people have impaired sleep, even if they're sleeping through the night, but they have, let's say, sleep apnea, or they have restless legs or fitful sleep, um, and, and even more so with frequent awakenings, that blood pressure spike can become accentuated. So all of these things tie in. Similarly, a big factor is cortisol. Cortisol spikes highest in most people early in the morning. And when you're under chronic stress conditions, that cortisol spike can be markedly increased. So all of these things are interactive and, and uh, part of the unified whole. And I would guess that you mentioned the immune system. That's probably a very key part of this as well, and inflammation. Right. So, so um, you know, the, the key is to get everything as aligned as much as possible. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, even like during our work day, I have a standing desk. I go up and down so that I can stand and sit and stretch. Otherwise, you sit around all day and you get like kind of stuck in the one, mo one, one position and then you're left with like neck stiffness, shoulder stiffness. You know, you, you asked me about what practices I do, and I think an important uh, pearl for a lot of patients also is, um, is deep breathing. Um, I cannot overstate how useful that can be. Learning how to breathe with your belly instead of your chest right. is so beneficial for your autonomic nervous system balance and your parasympathetic activity. And it also can be really a potent tranquilizer. I mean, you can feel the stress drain out of you. A lot of my patients know when that stress is coming. It's, it's that meeting with their boss, you know, every morning or, you know, the phone call from home and their kids are going crazy and their significant other wants to jump out a window and they're going to feel that tension and the knot, that knot in their stomach. And just by learning how to breathe slowly with your abdomen, six breaths a minute, and employing that, you know, here and there at your desk when you're feeling the tension rise. I mean, I, I think it's not hyperbole to say it's life-saving. If, if you can do that on a regular basis and keep your stress levels calm, it's huge. I agree. That's so true. Wow. Thank you for that wonderful talk and your time. I really enjoyed it. Same here. It was really a pleasure. Thank you so much, June. Next time we'll do a live session so that people can join and they can ask the questions. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I but love but it. this was good for COVID times. <laughs> All right. Enjoy your vacation. Relax. And I'll see you soon. Will do. Okay. You too. Thanks so much. So much. Stay Thank safe. You. you too. I know. Thank you.
All right, so that should be good. I, I'm going to extrapolate and export this, and then we'll probably be on um, social media. You're okay with that, right? Yep, absolutely. I'll send out an email. Sort of Would you be okay with me posting it also on my LinkedIn feed? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, it's good. Do I'll story. export it, and then I will actually give it to you. You might need to cut it, the beginning and the end piece where we're kind of chatting. Uh, but I'll export it and give it to you. It was really good. It was really, really awesome. I'm very grateful. You're my first guest, by the way. Really? Yeah. You're you're such, you seem like such a pro at this. I mean, you've got yeah. like the tech down. You're... Well, I, this is how I see my patients, literally. Right? Uh -huh. This is how I do my group visits. This is how I see my patients, whether they're here or at their home. And every single one of the patient visits are recorded. So I go back to it sometimes. Um, and kind of but, look but at the what concept, the concept of having guests on for topics. This is you're just starting this. It's a new yeah, endeavor. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm starting this, and you're my first guest. I'm, I'm honored. That'll be a trivia question one day when you're a complete, you know, famous rock star. Who was your first guest? <laughs> I don't know if you know somebody. There's somebody. Um, she does really mostly cosmetic stuff, but you know, mm -hmm. she calls herself longevity and, and you know wellness. But it's really mostly cosmetic. Her name's Sophia Din. I don't know if you've heard about her. She's no in, idea. She's in Oh, really? So we connected recently because my practice moved into the building where she is. And I uh -huh. used to see her all the time at the hospital because she was just like traditional, busy family medicine person. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so she wants to have me ho like do a similar thing, you know, for her practice. I, I talk and I propose some kind of, you know, simple topics like this, you know, where you can wrap your arms around. And she says to me, I have a great idea. Let's do... Um, <laughs> She said, let's do why eating less meat is good for the environment and your health. And I'm like, okay. So you just <laughs> pick like maybe the most controversial nutrition topic out there. And there's like tons of research to do on both sides of the argument. Yes, there is. There's I like said, so many different. Maybe now we're down. A little bit <laughs> so that's for, for me. <laughs> that's so cool. But well, this you're... is so good because I have to, you know, reacquaint myself with the information. That I oh, you are wonderful. Talk. And it's it's very much um, applicable and doable. I got trained in um, what is it transcendental meditation. I should go back to it. That actually has um, proof on like your IQs going up. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I think the greatest number of studies have been done with MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction. But I think that the magnitude is probably, I believe I've read that TM is the strongest. Probably because TM it's almost like a You franchise. know what? In that in that American Heart Association statement, they mm -hmm. give their highest level of, of recommendation to transcend meditation. Really? Yeah. They do. That's where they I read do. it. It's just like expensive to train, that's all. Yeah. Like sometimes it's just like a you know, like a franchise as opposed to like a true meditative like practice. But I, I also think a lot of people have a hard time um, doing it harder time focusing on like a thought or a word rather than on a body part or their sensation of their breathing. Um, Not too hard. For me, the challenge was that 3 p.m. Like 3 p.m. I'm busy. <laughs> like how to, do you to do it? Then, yeah. and like I could do it at night, like when everything sort of like before I go to sleep, like, you know, but they really insist on 3 p.m. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, That's God. really the hard part. The twice, so twice a day, the morning is doable. And then for I Me mean, to stop everything at not it's one, so but not at lunch, like at right. 3 p.m. It's like, what are you talking about? You know, Seinfeld, when Seinfeld did his show, that was in his contract to stop at 3 p.m. for his transcendental meditation. Jerry Seinfeld? Yes, Jerry I Seinfeld. Didn't know that. that was, I that's didn't part know that. of his huge success story is that I did transcendental meditation and I became a superhuman where I could memorize all the scripts and come up with wittier stuff and blah, 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 blah. But that was his like. Oh, I had no idea. That's yeah, no, cool. it's, a, it, it's a big sort of, um, he's a big fan of transcendental meditation. And he's like, if I couldn't break at 3 p.m., I couldn't do that for like years on end without being burnt out. Interesting. That break, that break was what enabled him to go on doing it for many minutes. I mean, I definitely feel I need to have 20 minutes of meditation a day, but it's a pipe dream at this point. I mean, I'm lucky <laughs> if I can do 10 minutes a couple of times a week. It's just, there is a never ending amount things I need to do for my, right. for my practice. But their That's whole notion is that because there's a never ending amount of things to do, you have to meditate you so that you become the super mind. That's their whole 
Well, so one of my patients who's a clinical psychologist and a big meditator says, think of it as you're actually going to gain time. Because you're going to be yes, that's, that's what they say. That's what they say. The and when I work. did it, I actually felt that. When I actually did it, I felt like, oh, my life slowed down, but I still am getting things down as opposed to being rushed and doing things, doing things, doing things like, a, you know, like a monkey mind going, going, going. But they say, do they say to get those benefits, you've got to do it twice a day? Yeah, I yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that made me sort of quit. I was like, <laughs> that I can't do it twice a day. Yeah. I mean, maybe I should just one day like lock it out and do it for a week straight, twice every day and see if that, because then I might get hooked if I see those. If you lock it out, then you, you probably could go on doing it. Um, but 3 p.m. was almost impossible. Unless you ate lunch at 3 p.m. That was your lunch hour. At that point, you might as well as be done with your day, right? And go home to your kids. Exactly. Anyway, it was really good chatting with you. Sorry we couldn't do this over a meal or anything like that. But soon. One day soon. One soon. day soon. I'm almost we'll there. That, we'll have that Japanese dinner again. <laughs> and it's good to see your face, even if it's not. Yeah, it's, it was very nice to see you. Thanks so much, June. All righty. No, no, then all the gratitude is mine. Thank you. Okay. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.